Hello and welcome to the Merit Makers Podcast. My name is Chris Skamra. I'm your host. Today with me in the studio, we have Lane Yerrick. Lane, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you taking the time, man, as always. Um, so in order to get started today, just so that you have a little bit of an idea of what we're about here on the show, essentially what Merit Makers is aimed at is helping freelancers in the Columbus and the Midwest area essentially um, have a platform to share their ideas, their mindset, their portfolio, experience. Uh, what we're trying to do here is get everyone connected. So um, a little while ago, I had the issue of, I know I've got the experience, the talent, the mindset. I've got what it takes to make it in this freelance world, and I just need to get myself in front of the right people. I yeah. figured that if, uh, if I had that problem, most likely other people did too. And so the whole point of the show is to try and help give everybody that has merit a chance to share their ideas, portfolio, and all of that. So um, that's how we're going to start today. And this is kind of me telling you a little bit about the show and also giving everyone else that's listening, whether you're on um, Spotify or Apple Podcasts or even YouTube, an idea of what we are trying to do. If you are joining us via Apple Podcasts or Spotify today, by the way, to our audio listeners, please feel free to check out the YouTube channel at Merit Makers Podcasts. You can then come and see the video version and uh, check us out in the studio and get an idea of some of Lane's and everyone else's work as well. We um, make sure to show some visual representations when possible. So with that note out of the way, um, Lane, to start things off, I'm going to ask you to share your social handles and then we'll get started. Yeah. So my personal uh, is Lane Yerick. Dot JPEG. So it's L A N E Y E R R I C K. You'll probably see that on the screen. And then my other account is at Yerick Media. So you can find me at either one of those. Sweet. Okay. That's no shame in splitting up the accounts there. I mean, that's what I did with the podcast. Um, in terms of anywhere else, you have LinkedIn, Facebook. I always want to try and double check and make sure that everyone can connect on the most um, useful platforms, but also. Um, most relevant as well. So is there any um, other platforms that you have that you may want to share? Yeah, if you want to uh, find me on LinkedIn, you know, shoot me a message, connect with me. Um, I'm not as active on there as as, um, as I used to be and as I should be, but um, as I'm kind of wrapping up school, my plan is to really be on there more, just connecting with people and posting. Um, and then feel free to check out my Vimeo as well, which you can uh, just type in Lane Yerick on Vimeo and you'll find me there. Sweet. All right. Thanks for those extra plugs. Yeah. I uh, really appreciate it. So, and in order to get started here, typically what we like to do on this show is kind of flip the traditional podcast setting where we do indeed touch on the story and the, the behind the scenes of how whoever the guest is got into the industry. But up front, what I love to do is try and get people's skill set and sort of their work ethic uh, in place so that when you're listening to that story, you, you kind of get a better sense of how this person got to where they are with that context. Um, and that's kind of a thing that I that I love to spouse about is how in today's culture and in today's media, while content is king, I think context should reign. That's kind of a little phrase that I've come up with. And uh, I think I want to try and keep making sure that's a thing in our show where if you are trying to um, share your thoughts and ideas, I would love people to know what is uh, Lane in particular trying to do while you're in school, but also as you are coming out. So um, not to get too far into the backstory, but I do want to touch on the fact that you are currently a student. Right. So let's maybe touch on a little bit of where you want to go in the industry right now. People that are listening are either freelancers, friends, family, but also potentially producers, directors, people that want to hire freelance workers. Mm -hmm. Um, in the film and production industry. So how about we kick things off with kind of starting where you want to go right now? What areas of interests do you have? What kind of positions would you fill on a, in a crew setting? And uh, just kind of give us a little bit of an idea of where your head's at. Yeah. So yeah, with school, I mean, I'm, I'm finishing up. So I'm very, very close to being done. Um, but when it comes to like the things I like to be on, like do on set, I think over the past couple of years, I've realized how much I love shooting and um, how much I love directing as well. And of course, the director role is not an, as easy to get as, say, uh, a DP or a PA. Obviously, that's you're heading up a whole crew there. But uh, when I'm on set, I really like being a DP, a camera op. Um, I'm also just, I think where I'm at right now, just so willing to be on set. And whether that means I'm a PA, I'm, I'm, I'm a gaffer, or I'm doing grip, you know, um, I'm totally willing to do those things because it's experience and it's fun. And it's something that it helps me learn as well. I, d I don't know everything and none of us do. And it's always a learning experience. And so 
I think, you know, if I was on set tomorrow, I'd be happy to do any of those things. But I think where I'm currently like hoping to go, especially now graduating, is being able to be hands on with a camera more um, and directing and being able to kind of call the shots of, you know, quite literally the shots. Um, I'm also I'm also I love editing. I do. Um, I would say that that love for editing is uh, much less than my love for shooting. Um, but as I said, I'm, I'm kind of in this place where I'm kind of liking to do all those different things. Um, but moving forward, being able to be hands on with a camera and being able to call those shots is what I'd love to do. That is it's definitely not uncommon around here, especially if you're in the Midwest, if you're in Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Indiana, Kentucky, any of those spots, anywhere around here where it's not a New York and LA, a Georgia, um, Atlanta, I mean, any of those hubs, typically you have a ton of people who wear a lot of hats mm -hmm. and it's both, it can be both a strength and an impediment, I think is the right word, uh, an impediment po possibly there's it's it's uh it can hold you back a little bit if you were to go out to those other markets um however i commend you for wanting to make sure that you can cover every area as uh, possible mm -hmm. and make sure you find out all of your interests typically a lot of people that will be on this show and that have come on in the past um aren't sticking to one field i fall into that category as well uh, over the years, I've gone through producing and sound at the start and editing at the very beginning, and then have graduated kind of into camera grip and electric um, in addition to producing. And so that's kind of my skill set. And so you're, you're sitting across the table from someone who completely understands what you're talking about. So to go into the, the calling of the shots, so to speak, um, this is another question I kind of like to throw at people is sort of what is your work ethic like or what is your view on projects because we have a lot of people in the industry who take different approaches if you are the type of person say you're doing documentary work mm -hmm. and you want to um, show up on set as prepared as possible but you don't have a script or you don't have that planned out okay here's what we're doing point a point b point c if you're doing doc work um, that's not a reality for you. You show up with your camera and you capture what's to be captured. Yeah. Maybe it's just interviews. You can kind of plan for those. But if you're like capturing a live event at a conference or if you are um, doing anything of that sort, there's only a minimal amount of planning you can do. But if you're doing like narrative or a feature project yeah. or even corporate work, you can, you can get that down to a T and make sure that every I is dotted and every T is crossed, not to sound like a broken record, but... Um, what is your preference, I suppose, for how you work? Are you more of a, I love to take it off the cuff and roll with the punches, or are you, no, I, I am a meticulous planner or something in between? Yeah, I think there's something, I think it's in between. Like, it depends on the project, like you said. Um, you know, I just did an interview for uh, a documentary I'm working on, and I think it also goes into the fact that I've been doing this for a little while, and so I kind of know what to expect on a shoot. Obviously, for a doc, and really any set, you never know exactly what to expect. You have a rough idea of how things will go and how, you know, I set up the camera here, I can set up a light here, this will probably look good. Um, and then let's just roll. Let's have the questions that I planned and let's let's ask these questions. Um, and so there's moments like that, like for interviews where I do plan, especially because I'm working with another person, where that planning is key. I don't want them to, I don't want them to uh, see me as someone who's not prepared, not planned. I don't value their time. Um, but I also want them to understand that I'm comfortable with this and like I know what I'm doing And so it's gonna be pretty casual sometimes just setting up really quick I'll have you sit down and it's a conversation um, with a narrative, especially with working other people uh, it's That that requires so much more planning and I can't say that I'm the best at planning um, I definitely feel like I'm getting better at planning because I've been in so many situations where my planning is lacking and I can see that in the product that we create as a group or if it's by myself. And so I'm, I'm somewhere in between where I'm kind of figuring out like the times where things need to be planned pretty heavily and the times where, no, I've, I've done this a lot and I think I, I know what to expect. And so I'm going to kind of, I don't want to say wing it because it does sound like that can come off as like, I'm not really preparing for this because I don't care. Um, but I think once you kind of know what to expect, you're able to set up the cameras, set up the audio and double check things. And then you're kind of good to go. And so, like I said, it depends on the project and where I'm at now, like finishing school, we've been tasked with some different kinds of projects. 
it's not always a narrative. It's not always a doc. Sometimes it's more corporate. Sometimes it's um, more experimental where, you know, planning is kind of out the window. But I think what, what I personally like is planning um, with that room for movement and that room for kind of going with the flow. Being able to set a project in motion, having your script ready, your actors set, your crew up to date, everyone on the same page, and, every, and creating an environment where everyone leaves at the end of the day happy, I think is a huge thing. And I know you didn't specifically say it that way, but in terms of my um, goals for how I want to run my own sets, I think we're pretty close on having that room for flow what people don't realize, I think, and I'm guilty of this as well, um, still do this constantly. Um, I don't take enough time to plan to make myself comfortable in the moment. I want to figure out a better way to phrase that in the future. But what I mean by that is if I figure out all the variables before the shoot and go through in my head in the days leading up to the project, what can go wrong? What can go right? What needs to happen? What questions need to be asked? And what problems can I solve before the day of the shoot? If I go through all of that and get to a point where I feel confident enough to say, put down the pencil and show up to set, not only does that eliminate anxiety and stress, but it allows us to have that freedom to make more creative decisions. And it allows you to be able to have a sense of freedom on set and enjoy the process. What I think a lot of people find not enjoyable is that stress and that tension of, okay, this thing happened, we didn't plan for it, but we're figuring it out and we're going. Sometimes that can be pretty fun. Uh, however, most of the time it's not, <laughs> as a lot of us know from experience. Mm -hmm. And so uh, making sure that you figure out everything beforehand, I think is an area personally, and I can only speak for myself, is an area that I'm still growing in and that I really want to grow in. Um, and it plays into the whole one of the big things for me in regards to the production industry is that we are professional problem solvers mm -hmm. and we are people that have a plan beforehand, but it om it's almost a guarantee every time something's going to happen and it's all about just being prepared for it. Yeah. And so having that mindset of, okay, figure out everything you can beforehand, make sure everyone's on the same page and create an environment where people can show up, create and leave content I think is one of my bigger goals mm -hmm. to sort of resonate to what you were saying a minute ago. That's really good. I agree with that. I think it's, I, I agree with what you said about um, you're still learning because I am too. Like I'm nowhere near, like I'm not, when people think of a planner, like it's not me. Like I just actually got a planner like a month or two ago, like to start writing things down because I'm just, I'm so bad at keeping track of things sometimes. But I think it's good to get to a point where your, peop your people on set, your crew is comfortable and they know that you have things under control, but it's not so rigid because you're so under, you're under so much stress because you're just constantly thinking like, okay, wait, is this going to plan? Did I plan this correctly? Um, it's, it's hard finding that balance and I can't sit here and say that I've found that balance, but I think it's, it's something worth working towards uh, because like you said, it relieves so much anxiety. And when you're on set, no matter the set, there's always going to be something that's going to stress you out. And so if you can eliminate that, I think that's, we should do our best to do that. Yeah, eliminate all the extra fluff. Make sure that you get uh, you get rid of the problems that you can beforehand, and then that leaves you with the amount of brain power and energy to be able to um, head on, take those problems that do show up out of nowhere, and then after that, maybe you have a bit of energy to uh, mess around and have some fun. Not that you should purposefully screw around on set, but um, I think everyone understands what I mean by make your time less stressful by having the stress beforehand. Um, and I think that can be phrased a little bit better, but, uh, point being, I totally agree with you. And, and I can also attest to not being the best planner, but a good thing to know for anyone out there who's interested in producing people get paid a lot of money <laughs> to get rid of those problems beforehand because it's the not fun part. And that's the thing a lot of people don't think about as well. If you want to get to that point where your sets are uh, on the high end and are professional and it's a very easygoing process. I'm not going to say you have to um, hire the best producer in town. You can do that yourself. But the thing to note is that not everyone's willing to put in the effort. Not everyone is able to sit down for hours, literally hours, and go through in their head every single thing that can go wrong on the day of and figure out how to solve it because mm -hmm. that's not fun. There's no 
there's no uh, excitement. There's no dopamine release. There's no, oh, hey, we just created this crazy thing. Instead of creating cool things on set, you're creating problems in your head, and that's stressful. Mm -hmm. And so having to figure out beforehand um, is not something that's fun. However, if you can get really good at that, and this is a tip to all the potential producers out there, myself included, uh, you can make some pretty nice, you can make a good chunk of change. And that's something I think a lot of people should start doing more is, is um, hiring on producers, not just saying that as a producer, but it can really help your process. And that's, that's a, I think, a point that a lot of people aren't really aware of. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, moving forward here, um, I know I, I said before, and I, I meant it, I want to get to your school stuff. But before we get there, um, I know you said you had a little bit of content to show. Um, did you bring, did you have like a reel possibly for us to see or any type of previous work you wanted to touch on before we get into stuff? Yeah, I've got a demo reel. Um, this demo reel hasn't been worked on since, well, it's from my, from 2019. Um, and so there has been some content since then that I've created. Um, I just haven't put out a new reel yet. Um, but within the past year, of course, with COVID, I mean, everyone can kind of relate to like not having as much work. So I do plan on having a new reel, hopefully in the near future. But the one that I brought today is from 2019. Okay, cool. Well, uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to show that. And uh, yeah. so, yeah, we're pretty much going to transition there. So roll film. And we're back for 2019. Not bad, man. Thank you. Very impressed. So as I always like to ask with anyone who does bring their reel on here, is there anything in particular from that collection of projects that you would like to share? Man, I mean, thinking about what I put in there, there's a few, there's one project in there that like starts it off with some of my favorite shots. Um, if you recognize it, it's from Ch downtown Chicago. The opening shot is Lake Michigan. Is that where that, that's by Chicago? Yeah. Um, and I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I should know. I'm pretty sure it's Lake Michigan. Geography, not my specialty. <laughs> I use cameras, not maps. <laughs> <laughs> but those, some of those were uh, some of my favorite uh, just because it was so, it was last minute. It was literally an overnight trip. Like we left at 1 a.m. and went to shoot um, and really just went to visit. And I was like, I'll just bring my camera. And I bought a gimbal just, you know, overnight. And I was like, let me just bring this. And it was really fun. And so it wasn't like my absolute favorite project. It never even got released because it was a music video for an artist from my hometown. And um, and I haven't talked to him about it. He hasn't talked to me about it in the past two years, three years. So I don't know if that's ever going to be released. But it was really fun. It was just it was challenging. Um, but it was it was fun because it was just it wasn't planned. I mean, what we were talking about earlier, planning and not planning, like there was one of the, that was one of those moments where. It wasn't planned and it could have been planned even, you know, it would have gone probably better, but it was still fun because it was just a quick trip to Chicago with some friends and I captured it. Um, there's some other clips in there from a few things that I did while at CCAD in my first couple of years um, that I'm pretty proud of. Like there's, there's one in there you'll see me acting and, um, and I've gotten into that more over the past couple of years, not a lot, but just a few things here and there. And it's really fun. There's, it's, um, it's called ghost investigation, paranormal haunt, not my typical thing. That's you know? awful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't come up with the title. My friend did. It was just supposed to be some crazy, you know, title that was just like, I think that's a combination of every ghost TV show in existence. But that one was really fun because that was another one where it was kind of semi-planned, semi-not planned. And it was just me and a friend who kind of just put these ideas together and just went and did it. And we were in, involved behind and in front of the camera, which was really, really fun. Um, 
That one got a lot of laughs out of people in my class, which was fun. That's always a good thing. Um, one of my professors didn't laugh, said it was not super funny, but that's okay. Sometimes you're going to get people that don't always like your stuff. But um, yeah, there's some, there's some things in there. You know, I look back at that reel and I can picture the times I was on set or just at an event capturing with my camera. And it's, uh, I look back at it and it's like, I can see the moments where it's like, I know I could have done that a lot better. Um, or I've learned this now where I know not to do this or like, Oh wow. I can't believe like, that's a cool shot. Like I still really like that. Um, but it brings back a lot of memories. It's kind of like nostalgic, even though it was two years ago, you know, but it was still like, um, I look back at some of the old shots that I had, um, from high school and that's where I really got started. Like that's, that's really cool looking back, remembering the times that I worked on set with my friends who some of them are still, uh, pursuing video and not necessarily film some more broadcasts. Some are, um, just doing even more photography now. Some aren't doing video at all. And it's really cool because I look back and I can think of specific people I worked on. And, um, I think that's something that's so valuable about being on set is just the connections that you'll make. And so looking back at like a reel or looking back at old videos is really fun. Even when you don't love the, the work that you created or you think that, you know, I've got so much better work I can show. Um, it's still really cool to look back at that. Absolutely. You're never going to make everyone happy. Um, l at least of all yourself. Mm -hmm. I think when you are showing people work, the person who knows it the best is you. And so you're never going to know what people are going to say. Yeah. Uh, you know all the imperfections because you've stared at it a million times. You know all the mess ups, all the things that went into it. It's your baby, but it's also your problem child. Yeah. And so yeah. while that's being said, it's also important to know that it's good practice to just get it out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've touched on this in the past with this show, but our work, while we are professional problem solvers, we are also artists and art is never complete. Mm -hmm. You just have to put it out there. Like this show is a testament to that. Uh, I didn't have everything perfect and polished on the first episode. And since then we've come out with a few more and we're going to keep on trucking. So yeah. um, for that, I am, I'm proud of you, man. Glad you Thanks, got that out. That. And so touching on your school stuff for a little bit, I'd love to hear the backstory yeah. and also kind of go into a little bit of how we first met and um, how you and I have sort of gotten to know each other a little bit. This is the first time we've sat down at length and have gotten to talk. Oh, yeah. Um, which is kind of surprising. Yeah. <laughs> you would think not, but um, I, I would love to hear your backstory and then maybe catch us up to present day where you and I have sort of interacted a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I started doing, so back in high school around 2013, 2014, if I remember correctly, um, I really started getting interested in design. There was a class at my high school called Interactive Media we were introduced to like the three big players of the Adobe suite, uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign. And that was like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. I'm going to be a designer. I'm going to have my own firm. I'm going to start making logos for people. Like it's going to be so much fun. And then I think one of the reasons I did that class, uh, not because I, I did it because I liked it, but the other class that I was really interested in w was not available for me, which was video productions. So I was like, oh, I can't do that till next year. So let me just do this now. And um, that next year came around. I took that class and I was like, wow, this is, this is so cool. This is what I want to do. We started off by, it was a one period class. It was um, mainly just learning, not a lot of hands on at the time. It was just background, which at the time I was like, come on, I just want to, just want to shoot something. And then we shot like stuff with little camcorders. Um, but that was so cool because I, that's really where I started learning about like just film and video and the background and how things started. Um, and at the time I wasn't interested in that history, but learning it and really learning it and then being able to shoot things here and there was just, you know, great because I'm like, okay, so now I can, I can see, you know, why these people, you know, how they created this and how it's evolved to where I'm at now. Um, it was a three-year program. So the first year was mainly learning a few hands-on things. The second year was more hands-on, and it was mainly broadcast. We did learn about film and cinema, but it was mainly broadcast and live production. So by that time, I think it was still a one-period class. It might have been two at that point. This is high school? This is high school, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so we started doing more um, news packages. We had a little studio, uh, not a little studio, actually, my, my, my high school, I'm still, like, impressed. My sister is there now. 
um, as a senior and she's her class is even better than mine like with the equipment they have available all black magic stuff sweet um what's the school hoover high school in north canton ohio yeah so they yeah they are continuing to impress me they got a studio f way back before i even uh, started going to school there from news channel 5 in cleveland they donated their their set and got to put it in their studio and that we had a whole extra room back there that was basically like you, you walked in it didn't feel like you were in the school it was editing bays and then you had upstairs with more editing bays and then you had conference room you had a sound room or like an audio recording room sound booth and then you had a classroom with computers and then you had the studio in the back with a whole control room and studio cameras and so we got to do more of that it was mainly if i remember correctly it's been a few years um creating those news packages and like one to one minute to a minute and a half just short little like broadcast like mini documentaries essentially and it was fun like i was like wow i think i wanted to broadcast like this is really cool and then the third year we did more of that as well as being in the studio and so we would switch like we'd have teams or like the sections of the class that would one week you're in here one week you're out here editing and shooting and that was really cool because i've never obviously worked in live production until then had no reason to nor any opportunities to and so we were just trusted as the students to take what we learned we had the teachers guiding us you know but we had been taught and we got to just put it to practice we had worked with the broadcast um, or yeah the broadcast class which was mainly people who were on screen and so we would work directly with them and they would be writing we'd be communicating with them okay how how's this transition going to work and then we'd go and record first thing in the morning in the studio and then sometimes they'd have to edit sometimes it would take a couple takes but it was such a cool experience because it, you'd walk into class and it was you're just walking into work and i didn't want to leave it was a three-period class so we were there for a couple hours and it was so much fun and at that time you know i'm thinking now we're, we're doing film as well one of the periods so we're focusing on short films and narrative but a majority of it was broadcast so i'm thinking you know i'm going to keep doing broadcast like this is what i'm going to do live live uh, production we did basketball games for our school we did shooting the plays and the musicals and it was so much fun but that's kind of what got me into it and then um i was still like really focused on doing film as well but at the time i was like i think broadcast and then film on the side you know that's kind of hard to do but so then I graduated and my sister had went to the Columbus College of Art and Design which is where I'm at now finishing up she went there for photography and minored in film and I'm doing the opposite I'm majoring in film and minoring in photography now so I started going there we just you know delve deeper into the history of cinema and being able to just create our own stuff like from the from the jump we were just like hey just create this project you guys have a week it's not going to be good I'm not going to give you a crazy grade, but let's just see what you guys got. And it, it challenged me and stretched me a lot. And one of the things that I had to realize going in was to let my ego just stay at the door. Because going in, I knew that I was going in with three years of experience. I was going in with um, experience of all these cameras that a lot of these people had no, never even touched. Some people that went to school with me have never you know, done anything with video until that first day. So I didn't want to go in, you know, with a big head thinking, okay, well, I'm clearly the best in this class, so I'm not going to learn much. I'll probably be teaching. That's not the case. I mean, there are moments where I'm able to, like, tell people, like, oh, yeah, I've actually had experience in this, and I can teach them and show them. But it was so uh, important not to do that with, like, a big ego and to kind of do it in a way that is harmful to people because – sometimes in my experience there can you can meet people like that and it happens and i think it's just part of human nature that we know something we want to let people know that we know it but so i've been there for the past four years again i'm finishing up now and i've just you know been learning and growing and doing the projects that have been given to me and um, really over the past two years i've been meeting so many different people outside of ccad that um, like yourself like i've been connected with so many people um, and I haven't worked with every single one of them. You know, I don't always stay in contact with every single one of them, but I know who they are. They know who I am. And we know that we're available if we need each other, which is so cool. I've, I've learned and grown so much. So now I'm in my like seventh year of doing video and I met someone named Jeremy Locks who 
um, I actually go to church with, and so that's how I met him. And he and I have done a, a few projects together. I've helped him with a commercial, um, and I've also helped him with his gallery, which is, I think, the first place that we really met. We never really talked that day, but I think we met at Ian and India, now I- India McHugh, uh, their wedding. You yeah. were shooting their wedding. Yeah. And I was doing their live stream. Don't tell anyone I shot their wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing their live stream and live stream, man, like everything just went wrong. Everyone wants to do live stream right now because COVID and it's totally understandable and, and it's profitable. It is. And it's, it's really a, a good idea. Um, the Wi-Fi there was not good. And so the camera that I was using was just not working with my computer and the cam link and the Wi-Fi was just so bad. The audio sucked. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is really bad. It all worked out in the end. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's where we met and we briefly talked here and there in passing, but that's where we're at today. That was back in November, I think. Yeah. It was a little, it was a hot minute. It's been a little bit yeah. since you and I got together, but that's, um, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. We kind of crossed paths. I had a little bit of an idea where you, uh, who you were, um, not as much where you were that night because I was behind a merch table <laughs> for uh, a <laughs> shout out to locks creative. Uh, Jeremy is hopefully going to be on the show eventually one of these days yeah, and same with Ian too. Ian's been mentioned a, a couple times now. He's kind of like the, the, the mysterious ghost that's haunting yeah. the show. He'll yeah. be on, he'll be on soon, hopefully. Um, but with our previous interaction, you and I, I think did first meet in person at Jeremy's, um, art show. However, we didn't really talk that much. And then, um, I talked to you a little bit at Ian and India's wedding um, when you were doing the live stream stuff. And you to get back to the main um, meat of your story, you touched on so many good things there, man, with the education system in general. This is something that I think I literally talked about last episode with Brian, and I, and I want to sort of clarify a couple points I made as well there. Um, I'd love to get your opinion on a few of the different... Mm-hmm. Um, a few of the different film student um, stereotypes yeah. that people typically have. Uh, first of all, I should say, is there any other thing that you'd like to share on your backstory or anything you'd want to mention before we move on? Because I want to make sure I give you the opportunity. Anything that we may have missed th- so far that you might want to bring up? Not necessarily. No, I don't think so. Okay, think cool. I'm Just wanted to hear about the stereotypes. That yeah, we wanted to check. To discuss. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's start with ego. So yeah, I will be the first to admit. I've been that guy mm-hmm. for a, a, a good while. That was that was me to some extent. Um, I won't claim to have had the most humble of attitudes back when. So I should probably give you a little bit of backstory and also share with the audience. Um, I started in this industry roughly when I was 13. There's an argument to be made all the way back to 2008, but that's another story for another time. Professionally, 2013. Um, as an editor and then from doing editing and and sort of I started out doing like gaming content YouTube videos I was inspired um, by a couple people that I was watching online started making videos with my friends that's how a lot of people our age have started on this journey and so after a a little while of doing that uh, my parents saw that I really loved the whole video thing and so I got into some classes with a local producer just doing like a summer camp type thing And then after that, um, I went into a career center. There's been some client projects and other bigger um, short films and even a feature that I was on before that point that I'll probably talk about someday. But the the thing I'm trying to get to here is my time at the Delaware Area Career Center, which is a trade school off of State Route 23, north of Lewis Center, south of Delaware. If uh, if anyone out there is local to the Columbus area, you probably know exactly where I'm talking about, Um, north of Columbus pretty much. And that school offers a very similar program to what you mentioned. And we we have very similar backgrounds here. In high school, junior and senior year, I was in the digital design program at DACC, Delaware Area Career Center. Hopefully I'll have some of my instructors on at some point. I would love to get them on and have them as guests here. Um, Some of my favorite teachers I've ever had in my life, and I'm not just saying that because I was homeschooled, (laughs) uh, were at this digital design program. Josh Galligan, Will Rowland. Um, There's a third teacher that's there now that I unfortunately was not able to have as an instructor because he came in after I had graduated. Mm -hmm. Very recent. I'm sure they're happy to have the help now. But the point I'm trying to get to is that during my time at that school, I was coming in as well with 
ooh, let's see, I joined the program 2017, 2018, so I would have had about the same amount of experience before going in. And this is at a high school level, mm -hmm. though. So before going into that program, three to four years of working in the field or knowing um, a lot of the ins and outs. So I had the ropes down pretty good. That gave me an opportunity to um, not necessarily pick where I want to go, which is kind of what this program's aim was, to introduce people into the world of media and get kids interested in doing stuff like, um, well, I should touch on this first quickly before I get back to my story. What the Career Center offers for their digital design program is they offer essentially, um, uh, they, they call it, I believe, career pathways, and I may be um, mistaken there, so instructors, feel free to correct me when you come on. <laughs> uh, they offer different areas of study. So you can pick essentially a education or a curriculum path in different areas. So there's video production, photography, animation, um, graphic design, audio production, and I'm missing one um, animation, video, photography, audio, graphic, web design. That's mm -hmm. the sixth one. There's six mm -hmm. in general. And so like coding, back-end development, et cetera, that's what the web stuff is. Mm -hmm. And so you can, as a junior in high school, go in and see all these areas, get a little taste of everything. As you're going through the program, that's essentially what you do for your first half year, three quarters of the year when you're there, is try out a little bit of everything, see what sticks, see what you don't like, and then pick the area you want to build your skills on, and then just go for it. They tailor your curriculum to you. This is not a paid for advertisement or promotion of the Career Center. <laughs> However, as a former student and someone who still endorses that program um, wholeheartedly, I totally encourage people to go. And that kind of conflicts a little bit um, with my statements that I made on our previous episode. And so I want to get to that as well. Um, as a homeschooler uh, for the majority of my education, and as someone who has a very um, self-learning driven mm -hmm. mindset, it is easy for me to be able to pick up something and learn it. Previously, I've expressed um, my, I suppose, my, my negative feelings, or I, I am by no means a proponent of the public education system, I should say. Mm -hmm. Personally, as someone who just came out of interacting with that environment at the Career Center, even though it's a trade school, there's still an academic side of things. Um, coming from that environment, I can wholeheartedly tell you that no one wants to be in school anymore. Back in the day when people weren't able to read and write, it was a great resource. Mm -hmm. But now it feels more like prison, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And that's not to demean any teachers or principals. There are plenty of people who work at these institutions that genuinely want to help the students. Oh, yeah. But there are so many, so many that are just there and they don't care. And it really shows. And the students don't get anything out of it. Schools nowadays, in my opinion, I don't want to, this is what I said to Brian as well, I want to make sure I'm expressing my own views and it's not mm -hmm. yours. Um, I want to make sure that when I'm talking about this, it is coming from my mouth and I'm not putting words into yours. Mm -hmm. And I also want to see what your thoughts are in sort of like a, either a bouncing board or kind of see where you stand on this as well. My opinion of the current public education system is that um, they're now being used more as daycares in the younger side of things mm -hmm. because we have a severe lack of parental responsibility. Parents aren't teaching their kids. Um, and for that being said as well, there's a lot of reasons for that. People now have to have two incomes to get by. Mm -hmm. So moms, moms and dads have to work. And um, the whole reason for this rant is to say, uh, on the parenting side of things at least, I realize that there are reasons the system is the way it is, but I am by no means a proponent or a supporter of the public academic system. Mm -hmm. When it comes to these colleges or these trade schools that solely focus on these extracurriculars, I think it's fantastic. So getting back into the point about ego, right? Mm -hmm. That's where this all started. Yeah. Coming from an area where I am very self-driven and I can create projects from start to finish and I've had experience, my instructors saw this as an opportunity to let me spread my wings a little bit. Unfortunately, I spread them too far, um, and it cost me some friendships. That is something that I think a lot of people don't think about, and it's a great experience to have when you're in high school. I say that lightly because um, you don't want anyone to go through that ever. But going through having 
a large ego in high school caused me to be able to see for myself the negative repercussions of what that could do in the professional world. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that to make my head big or make me seem like, oh, I've learned so much and look at me, but it's all in an effort to communicate to people. It is best to keep your ego and leave it at the door, Mm -hmm. keep it to yourself, than to come off like you know everything. Since that time, I've sort of developed another saying, um, I know everything about nothing, which does not imply that I'm an idiot (laughs) or that I know absolutely nothing at all, but rather I will always have more to learn Mm -hmm. and that there will always be more that I do not know. And therefore it is much better to use both of your ears and only have one mouth instead of uh, the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm gonna let you talk in a second, don't worry. (laughs) But there's a a lot to to get out here. Um, With my instructor at the Career Center, um, he's a hype man. Respect the heck out of him. Like th- we're talking about uh, Josh. We his nickname's G for his last name Galligan. Josh Galligan, one of my favorite instructors I've ever had to date. Um, and it is only by my own fault that I took the praise that he would give me for the effort that I put in. And he would argue that, hey man, you did a lot. And I'll admit I put in everything I had, and it showed. But I let that get to my head. Mm. And I was that guy. I was that person that people despised it hurts to say Mm -hmm. but it also is doing i think a benefit to at least people listening or watching if you're on youtube to know that you can come out of that you can change because that's what i've tried to do since then and uh the 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 stuff i don't know if you if you've kept up with my social media Mm -hmm. um but what i really try to do is on the side as well on top of all this camera genie producing stuff is uh, I specialize in behind the scenes photography Mm -hmm. and I like to share my work and promote other people and make them look good on set. I've talked about this in the past on the show. And uh, with that, I also try to now be as vulnerable as possible and share what's going on in my head. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're looking for kind of where my mind is at now, you won't find a lot of that, oh, I know everything or I am better than you on those posts. Mm -hmm. I'm much now trying to go a different direction and help as many people as possible, but also share my growth, my struggles, and not just the highlights. Um, Because if you look at it, almost none of those photos are me. They're other Mm -hmm. people, but also share the um, growth of my own mindset and other people as well. So Mm -hmm. I don't know how long I've been going for, but I'm going to take a break. So what do you think about all that? (laughs) Yeah, well, first off, that's that's really good. I appreciate you sharing that. there's so a lot to unpack there. Tons. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. I think that's so important because I think so so often we can just talk about and th- not just specifically here. I mean, like anytime you're with people who, you know, just you're just talking about the industry, you're talking about cameras, you're talking about gear, and that's fun. But I think it's so good, important to talk about like, hey, this is a this is a problem within the industry. This is a problem within myself. Like. Um, I think it's really easy to to have an ego, especially when you know so much, um, because we've talked about this and you said this earlier, your work is your baby, you know, and it's um, I've created stuff. I've been on projects where I'm in charge of it. And so when people come in with a differing opinion, I'm like, ah, I don't want to listen to you, you know, and, yeah. and you don't necessarily have to just listen to every opinion and put that put that into your video. But I think it's valuable to understand and to let people know that you're working with that you are open to like learning from them and open to ideas um man yeah there's so much to unpack there because um like sorry let me gather my thoughts here no absolutely and if if you need to take a minute to think like we can just come back in a second so it's up to you no i'm just trying to think of the points that you brought up throughout that um yeah, there, there was a lot, and that's that's kind of on me. If I go oh, too man. long, it's like there's <laughs> – that's the thing, too, is if you're if, if we are in this environment and uh-huh. if we're talking back and forth, and this is just a note to everybody, if anyone ever ends up on a podcast and someone goes on a long string like I just did, you will have something really cool you want to say. You'll hold on to it, and they keep talking, and they keep talking, and they keep talking, and then it goes away, and you forget, you're like, where'd it go? And so you have to then uh, sort of reel yourself back in and find a new point to cover. So mm-hmm. to, to rehash a little bit, let's maybe just start from the beginning there. What's your opinion on, on high school education programs, training, yeah. and then we'll maybe yeah, get into yeah. the little little bits of the ego and, sure. and all of that moving forward, because I think this is going to be some pretty interesting conversation. So yeah, both of us coming 
from film school, quote unquote, backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's uh, a help or a hindrance? Who do you think that serves or is it even necessary? Yeah, Um, I would say, you know, it's it absolutely can help you. I think it all always depends on how you react. Um, And that's with anything, you know, it depends on how you take that information and, and go forward in life. I think having that three years, even though I'm not doing really anything with broadcast now, I'm not doing a whole lot of live production. Um, I'm doing some here and there, but it's it's still super valuable um, because it was so centered around just video. It wasn't, you know, it was very holistic, um, which is a good thing and a bad thing sometimes where, you know, we're getting just this whole like, um, grouping of different subjects. It's not just directing. It's not just shooting. It's everything. Um, but but you're not focusing on the other subjects like math, science, and all that, all those other things. Like you were saying, the Career Center is so focused on, you know, you pick a certain area and you focus just on that. And having like those three periods of class in my senior year where we just spent hours just, it wasn't necessarily like a rigid like come and sit down. It was come in and you know what you're doing. You have a job. Feel free to walk around the studio, talk to your the other students, um, see what they're doing, see how you can help, see if they can help you. Yes, yeah, open environment. Yeah, yeah, the open environment is such is such a better environment than sit down and let's talk. And I don't think there's, I think there's value in lectures. Um, I think there's value in, in sitting down and learning because sometimes, like sometimes for me, I just need to sit down and just listen to my teacher talk. Um, if I'm just given like the opportunity to just be on my computer and be just doing what I want, I can just easily find so many things to do or research while they're talking and I'm not going to pay attention. But yeah, that open environment was, was so important because it also allowed us as students, these teenagers to realize that we're, we have value in this area. We have the ability to make our own decisions, to make our own work, um, and we've got supervisors that are going to be walking around talking to us like like equals, which was so incredible. My my teachers, I still communicate with them uh, constantly, and they've always talked to me on like a an equal level where it's not clearly they have more experience, and I recognize that and I respect that authority. Mm-hmm. But they're also talking to me like, hey, like I know you're still learning, but I also know that you know a lot. Um, and I want to talk to you about like just this on like a just an equal like playing field essentially. That was really important, and I think that I won't say that you know I'm so much better off than all these other people, and no one will ever be able to be as good as me. You know, I think it's easy to feel that way because you get something so good, like like the both of us having that extra education. That's so good, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's easy just being a human to see that. And to think less of another person, and and so it just takes being aware of that. Um, I had to be aware and conscious going into college, realizing, okay, Lane, you're gonna want to take hold of this, and just this is gonna be your personality. Like you just want to be the guy that has more knowledge than everyone else, but you can't do that. Like you have to. I had to be really like intentional about keeping myself in check, um, and even like what I was touching on earlier, just the things that I want to do on a set. I think it's so important to be willing and to be open to just playing any role that you can to help people. Because if someone comes to you and asks like, hey, can you be a PA for this? It's like, well, I've had this experience and I've already been in school for like seven years. So I really think I'm past being a PA. And you probably won't work with that person too much like more after that. You won't get called back. No, no. no. And I think (laughs) even if you have been in the industry for 30 years and I can't speak on, you know, people who I can't speak for people who have been in the industry for 30 years. So maybe they'll disagree with me. Yeah. But, you know, let's say you've been in the industry for a while and you get a call from a friend of yours and it's like, hey, I know this isn't paid like a lot and it's a super small position, but can you help me? Like if you help that person, they're going to see you as just a good friend, as someone who's willing to help and not necessarily as just a PA or just a gaffer. They're going to see you as someone who is willing to help and someone who is trustworthy. And so... I think it's it's also taking that step of just being open to wear those different hats, even though those hats may have, you know, you may have outgrown those hats um, mm-hmm. in your head. You may think, well, no, I've had this experience for how long? I feel like I should be doing more. Um, I think that helps combat the ego. Um, I think it's very easy for us to get an ego in the film industry 
because like I said, you make something, it's your baby, it's art. You you pour your heart into this. You want to take a hold of that. You want to hold it close. And whenever someone criticizes it, you know, it, it's easy to just lash out. And not necessarily lash out, but just to be upset or have criticisms. And I think being open and communicating with people and maintaining friendships, and you don't have to be best friends with everyone you work with, nope. but I think there needs to be a good relationship on set because not only does that like help you get more jobs in the future and maintain just like a good relationship with someone who can get you paid, it just creates such a more, like that environment on set is gonna be so much better when each of you know, like, hey, we're all doing this together. It's very cliche to say we're in this together now because every company yep. has said that for the past year. Yep. <laughs> but that's the reality. You're you're working with these people on set, um, and it could be a big set, it could be a small set, but you're working with these people to get the same goal, to create the final product. And you need to be able to work with each other. You need to be willing to, um, to ask questions, to talk to each other, to be open, and to, when people ask questions, to not get upset when that question might come off as like, you don't know this, like just, just being honest and communicating. And I think that's why going back to like high school, looking at the open, um, environment and open environment. Yeah. Is so beneficial as opposed to just sitting down and making it all about, I don't want to say making it about the individual. Uh, let me rephrase that. I think that open environment is so much more beneficial um, to students who are going into any industry really, but film specifically, because it allows for those conversations to happen naturally. It allows for those relationship, relationships to flourish and for people to pick each other's brains. Yeah, and mix the industry. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think that that is one of the most important things that a school can do is prepare you mm -hmm. for the real world. I think that was its original intention. Yeah. And unfortunately, on the academic side, it has gone so far away. But thankfully, you got programs like our high school education and then the uh, career centers and the trade schools that are still giving that really good um, tech slash industry slash trade oriented prep. Um, and the, the stuff you can take away from those programs is phenomenal just on a core level because it, it totally is a really great investment of your time, but also for your skills because you can then, like you said, take that experience onto set and then be like, well, I've been doing this already for so many years. Um, I actually sort of disagree with you a little bit. I don't think that uh, I, I don't think that it is the right thing to come off as, well, no, I'm above that. Mm -hmm. However, I am also, I suppose, guilty of doing that in a form or in a sense where I tell people, um, well, I can PA for you. Here is my rate for that. Mm -hmm. Typically, I also price myself out of PA because I am much more of a valuable asset in other areas. And I think oh, that's, that's, a, that's a key thing to mention is... If you don't know anything and you just want a PA or you're just starting out, by all means, be a PA. Mm -hmm. Learn the ropes. Uh, keep your ears open and your mouth shut, and you'll learn a ton. But if you are already experienced in so many fields and all people see you as is a PA, you kind of got to get your name out there. You got to take other jobs. And that's kind of where I'm at right now is people, when I walk on a set, mm -hmm. people see a kid. They don't think I know anything, and that's before I open my mouth and before I start casually laying hints that I do know what I'm talking about yeah. and do you want help with this particular thing because I've done this before mm -hmm. or hey why hasn't this happened yet are we stalled on something and you know just fill in the blanks with whatever the that is people kind of get clued in a little bit and then you start to casually gain more traction mm -hmm. and have more responsibilities handed to you it's a finesse it's a dance yeah. whenever you are communicate communication as a whole is a dance but um on set in particular, not stepping over the line and instead pushing it forward a little bit with each conversation you have or relationship you build, I think is how you have to do it these days because people aren't going to give you responsibility if you can't show them you can handle it. Yeah. I think you bring, you bring up a really good point um, and I appreciate you kind of like pushing back a little bit what I said because I actually, now that you say that, I, re I agree with that. I think, because I've had a professor tell me one time, um, that he'll still take like these $200 jobs, which is like, you know, fine if you want to do that. But this man has been in the industry for 
maybe 40 years. Um, and so I think he's gotten to a point where in his own life, in his own personal life, where he's wanting to do that and able to do that, and it's totally fine. But I think it is a good point that you bring up that um, – that sometimes when you take a job just for the sake of taking it or to please that person, I think it can come off as, you know, well, he's just a PA. He's just this. And you were talking about going on set and sometimes people just see a kid or they see someone who well, they probably don't have a lot of experience. But in reality, you do. And I think from my experience, I've been on set before where sometimes you can get together with other videographers who maybe you've never met before. And it's kind of like a guessing game where you you kind of like you're like, well, I want to see what they have to say about this topic. I want to see how much they actually know. And then it kind of becomes like an ego thing, like an ego battle almost, which I participated in where it's like, oh, yeah, I've worked on this before. Oh, yeah, me too. Back in like high school. But it's whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. <laughs> but I was on a set recently with Ohio HD and, and a student uh, from CCAD, another student from OU. And it was one of like the healthiest like set experiences of my life. It was really small. It was just a bunch of us. It was a couple of guys. We we're all in our 20s. And we all had a conversation the day before while we were prepping gear, just understanding who we are, like the background we came from. Um, and when um, Elvis from Ohio HD would ask me, you know, hey, do you know this? He's like, I don't want you to think I'm asking you because you don't know. I'm just trying to understand. And I'm like, no, dude, ask me. That's I appreciate that because sometimes I don't know. And I need you to – I. it's awkward to be like, um, hey, can you tell me how to do this? And then it's just this weird thing where we're trying to understand without talking what – where are we at? Like what is your experience level? And I know my experience level. It's, it's this weird thing, and it can get us in our heads. But I think those set experiences where you're just open and you you tell the people like, hey, if you have questions, ask me. It doesn't matter what question it is. It's not a stupid question. Let's figure it out together. And because you were at that point, you were there at some point yeah, in, in your past. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, I think we need more of those set experiences. And I think I'm, that's the kind of set I hope to direct, you know, is, is a set where questions can be asked and answers can be given in a way that doesn't, you know, make one person feel less than, you know, it, it doesn't matter if, I've got more experience than you or vice versa, we can still communicate on a level that we're working together, we're on set, let's get this done efficiently, let's get this done together, you know? Yes, and so let me tell you something about Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> this man, back when I was first getting introduced into the Ohio HD world, which honestly from my experiences with them have been majority positive, I have a lot of respect for every person there. Unfortunately, it's been really sad to see COVID affect everybody, mm -hmm. but those guys specifically, because yeah. I know they, um, they've they done a lot of beneficial stuff for their community. And as someone who has benefited from either their networking events or being mm -hmm. able to be on set with them where they bring me on to do this like sort of PA or even grip yeah. work, um, point being back to, back to Elvis, um, he and I have had kind of a strange relationship where at first we had that exact same, hey, let's figure this out, but we're not talking, mm -hmm. where he's kind of trying to gauge me, I'm trying to gauge him. And at first uh, it was a little awkward, at least for me, and I can only speak for myself back to that point. Um, but our relationship has gone from barely knowing each other to I think he's now one of the people I'm more close to mm -hmm in terms of uh, just pure relationship standards because of a few different things where we've kind of now over the course of however many months or even years it's been since I've been interacting with those guys, uh, he and I specifically have grown a little bit because we've given each other time to evaluate. And that's something yeah. I don't think a lot of people do um, on set or in the environments that we regularly find ourselves in. You only have the few minutes at breakfast or right before call time to mm -hmm. evaluate who you're working with, what they know, what they do. Yeah. And then you take those assumptions into the field and they either serve you or you have made a terrible mistake and completely misread who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. um, with Elvis in particular, I have a story there. There's, there's a good friend of mine as well, a, a DP, um, a family man as well in the local Columbus area. His name's TJ Cooley. 
Uh, TJ does a lot of work with MOFA. He also has um, a lot of work done for different festivals around mm -hmm. town. He and I have worked together in the past and over the course of like summer 2020 and um, pre-COVID a little bit as well, he and I became friends, TJ and I, at the 2020 Ohio HD Gear Show. Um, I went as a volunteer, and so I was helping out um, running things on the vendor side mm -hmm. where I would basically just take care of the, the different vendors and, and uh, guests for the expo. And I want to make it clear as well, uh, I was not hired on for any salary position. Mm -hmm. It was not anything like super high level priority position or anything. No, I was there to help. And the need that I was able to show up and fill was, mm -hmm. hey, the vendors need taken care of. And I've done this before in the past as well, where if you as the Sony representative or the Fuji guys need batteries, snacks, mm -hmm. water, pens, the whole time I was there, I was just circling the building because it's connected and, and you can run yeah. laps. Um, just making sure that they had what they needed, the vendors. Mm -hmm. And since I was there doing that, it gave me an opportunity to network, but also catch up with some friends. Yeah, TJ comes in um, towards like the, the first half of the day, and we get to talking about Apple boxes. If you're not familiar with TJ, not only is he a DP, but he's also a bit of a handyman. Um, he has in the past done some really great work with Apple boxes and even has created some of the ones that Ohio HD rents out. So mm. um, that's kind of a pride point for him where he is created these pieces that have been on countless productions uh, because everyone needs an apple. Mm -hmm. And so TJ and I are talking about that and about his work, and, and he's telling me and getting fired up about a story about how this guy kind of screwed him over uh, in relation to these uh, apple boxes or in regards to a different story. Elvis sees that from across the room, puffs up his chest and kind of <laughs> walks over and goes, bro, what are you doing to my boy Chris, man? Like, what's, <laughs> what's going on here? He's trying to bust in and defend the little guy, a.k.a. me, because I'm a child. And because TJ, if you, if you don't know him, he's, he's a tall, he's a tall mm -hmm. guy. He's, he's, uh, he can be pretty intimidating, and his personality uh, matches that. He can be a little brash, and he puts himself out there, and that's, that's one of the things I like about them. But Elvis going in doesn't know that TJ and I are good friends. <laughs> and he comes in, and he hears the conversation, like overhears it, and he thinks TJ's yelling at me, this little volunteer kid who's just there to help. And mm -hmm. he, he breaks up the conversation and doesn't understand Elvis and I know each other. TJ, with his brash and outgoing personality sees Elvis as a threat and goes <laughs> like, like, who do you think you're talking to? I have contributed so much to this company, blah, 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 blah. This is not to make TJ look bad in any way. And I think I, I misphrased what he said as the comeback a little bit. But the point was TJ defended himself. Elvis had no idea we were friends. And that meant a lot to me that Elvis would, would bust into the conversation and try to save me like that. Mm -hmm. And so that, that meant a lot. Elvis, if you're listening or anyone at OHD, make sure he does see this. Thank you. Uh, it means a lot, and I respect Elvis all the more for that. And I, I would love to actually have him on the show because he wants to be a DP. Yeah. I, last time I checked, like, yeah. I, I'm i pretty sure that he is trying to work himself into that field. Mm -hmm. So, Elvis, if you're out there and you're listening, feel free to come on the show, man. Would love to have you. Anyone yeah. from OHD, really. Um, all of that to say, love the guy to death. Yeah, and good guy. I I've can, only met him once, but very good guy. Yeah, I can, I can totally relate to... Um, your feelings towards Ohio HD. I think one of their main priorities is to uh, make the customer happy. Mm -hmm. That can be a good thing. That can be a bad thing. Time for a little bit of realism. Um, there, and I want to be careful in the way I say this because you want to keep good relationships with your mm -hmm. rental companies and with your um, your your distributors around Absolutely. town because there's only so many of mm -hmm. them. And if you're in a bind on a shoot, and you need to get a piece of equipment fast or something breaks or you need a discount on something to just make that budget work. Mm -hmm. If you don't have, if you've burnt that bridge with that company, they're not going to help you out. Yeah. And so um, there are some criticisms to be made of everybody, freelancers and rental houses. Um, and so I think I'll save that for another time. But all that to say, I still hold a lot of respect for those guys. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm very grateful for what they've been able to do for me as a young guy and an upcoming uh, student and freelancer and so I totally relate to um, your sentiment there any other experiences that you've had with um, Ohio HD in the past perhaps have you done any like volunteering with them was was that your first time in the studio there with that shoot like can you tell us a little bit about that or is there an NDA to, am I not allowed to ask no yeah we can talk about that um no actually it wasn't in their studio we actually shot um, a music video 
so it was Elvis was the only one from Ohio HD, I believe. Mm -hmm. The director was actually uh, her name is Nanette Lay, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But she was originally a student at CCAD. I forget how long ago. I don't want to say a certain amount of yeah. certain number, you know, just to not get her age right. But she works in New York now, runs a production company there, but has been in Columbus, and she was running that set. Um, so I haven't had too many experiences with Ohio HD. I've been there a few times. One time um, I went there to visit with my, I used to work at the um, CCAD student agency, their marketing agency, um, as a videographer there. And so we took a visiting like trip there to see the, what's the arm? Uh, the bolt? The bolt, yeah. yeah. Uh, we got to see that and just take a tour of their studio, which was really cool. Um, and meet some of the guys there. There was another time that I had went, I, it might have been for another class, um, just to tour their space. And I don't think I talked to too many of the people. I think I connected with like Scott, um, just like on LinkedIn. And we just, he toured the place for us, um, which was really cool. So I haven't had too many experiences actually working with them. That was one of the only ones. But I've been in their studio, got to see that. So I would love to just be in the studio for when they have like an actual shoot, um, just because it's such a cool space. And just being on set is so much fun anyway. But yeah, I haven't too, have it, I haven't had too many experiences with those guys, but um, all the ones I've had have been very good. So I, I, I do think they have a very good sense of where their PR is and how they fit into the market. Mm -hmm. That is uh, something I give them props on is their, is their marketing and their involvement in the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and with that being said as well, one thing I'd love to know about your experience in regards to how do I phrase this? Um, being sort of a, a jack of all trades, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you know everything. Um, what is your mindset on working with these companies or these studios as a up and coming person in the industry? Because I think a lot of people don't realize the value mm -hmm. in the connections that these rental houses or even production companies like Jeremy's that we talked about can yeah. bring. Mm -hmm. Because those are the guys that are going to hire you. Yeah. And you don't want to burn those bridges, not no, to go back to that all. point. But do you see yourself as someone who would is more self-reliant, I suppose? You want to make your own sets, or are you more open to collaborating with people? Because this is important for those listening. If they want to interact mm -hmm. with you or bring you on um, or even just find you to say, hey, I am a PA, I am available, you now have my number in case yeah. you, they you want to bring them onto your sets. What's your stance on collaboration is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. I think collaboration is like key, especially when you're starting out. I think there's nothing wrong with wanting to run your own set and just taking control. Cause I think if you're an artist and you create something, then I think you should be okay with making it the way you want to make it. But I don't think that you should do it in a way that um, comes off as like, I don't ever want to work with other people. And so I think while if you're in college or maybe you're not in college, you're in high school still, but you're starting, I'd say, if you can connect with people, do it. It might not be, you might not work with them for years. It doesn't, you never know. But I think establishing a relationship or just a connection and an understanding that you're there and that you're available is really important because yeah, they're going to call you at some point and maybe you can't take that job and that's okay. But I think, um, I think collaboration is huge. I think working with other people and getting other ideas and perspectives is really important as well. And that is one of the things I think that I value the most about being in Columbus. I have been here for the past four years and some of the best moments within my film career here have not always been the projects that I've made, but the people that I've met along the way. And that sounds very cliche, sounds like a coming of age movie type thing where it's like the friends we met along the way, but it really is. It's the, it's the people that I met and the names that I can call on that I know that I can trust and they do good work and They'll be there um, if I need them, and it's going to be the same for them where they might not be able to take it. But there's an understanding that I can call you, you can call me, and we both have our own things going on, and that's okay, but it's it's a name we can call out on. And so I think, yeah, if you're starting out, meet as many people as you can. Like go to networking events if they're available, uh, especially now. Join those Facebook groups that exist for um, Central Ohio and – um, just get get acquainted with people get your name out there and I think that is a great way to start because you're gonna meet new people you're gonna learn new things and you can just be involved in a lot of cool projects as well that and also like there's let's go back to that other point that we that you mentioned um, 
because I think it's very important. We touched on it a tiny bit, but it's really, really key. You never know who you're going to meet, mm-hmm. and you never know who those people that you meet, who are PAs, who are grips, mm-hmm. who are interns, that will then, in the future, two, three, even one year down the line or more, yeah. five, ten, mm-hmm. go and hire you because you treated them with respect mm-hmm. and you saw them as a person and not an underling. Right. Um, like you like you said a, a minute ago, and this is something I talk about all the time as well, when, and, and I can only speak from my experience, when I go on set, oftentimes on a more professional level, if I'm looking, if I'm working, excuse mm-hmm. me, with people who've been in the biz for 10, 15, 20 years, I'm a kid. I am, to go back to a previous story, a child (laughs) in their eyes until I tell them, hey, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then once that comes across and they they, they, uh, loosen up a little bit and allow you as the new kid on the block, so to speak, to get a little bit more responsibility, that's when people start to realize, oh, this guy's taking this seriously. It's not just a hobby. It's Mm -hmm. not just a... um, uh, hey, I am in college and I'm just trying this out. Mm-hmm. It is a no. I have been working in this for years, and this is what I love to do and what I want to, yeah. uh, what I want to grow in. So let me help. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The the entire one of the main reasons, and there are a lot of reasons, but one of the main reasons I made this show in the first place mm-hmm. is because I experienced this problem. Mm-hmm. People were not taking me seriously as a freelancer and as someone who was always reaching out and always networking and always meeting people. Because they see my age and they discount all of the credits and the experiences underneath that. Mm-hmm. Not that the credits should get you the work yeah. in the first place. It, more so it should be your attitude and mm-hmm. how you treat people. Uh, but experience does matter because then that allows for trust. And once that trust is there, your relationships can flourish. So right. um, have you experienced that similar, hey, kid, what are you doing? Or... Um, People, I guess, underestimating it, which could which could be a good thing. Um, I've had that be a very good thing. I've, I've leveraged that to my benefit, mm-hmm. where people just see me as some assistant, and then I come and blow them out of the water, not to make my head big or anything. But yeah. you can totally do that, and that's mm-hmm. cool when that happens. But you got to make sure you do it in the right way. So right. I'm going to shut up. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like I have had those experiences. I've had um, some people come in who have been in the industry for 30, 40 years to you know, kind of show us um, whether it's equipment or techniques at the school. And I think when you're coming, when you're coming in and you just are talking to a group of students, I think it's easy just to assume, okay, you guys are learning. You probably don't know this, so I'm here to teach it. And so I don't necessarily uh, blame people in those settings, oh, like yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in an education setting, mm-hmm. for automatically assuming that the skill level is less than um, theirs, you know, especially being that they've been in the industry longer. Um, but in those like close proximities being like, uh, while he's working on a camera or she's working on a camera and you're working on setting up audio for that camera, you can talk and you can ask them questions and then, um, it can kind of lead to like you telling them what you know already, essentially. Um, I've had those moments and they've been brief, but it's been really cool. Like this, there's some people that I've talked to where I briefly mentioned, like, uh, when we were in high school, I started learning avid media composer to edit oh, which, props. <laughs> which is like <laughs> respect if dude i don't remember how to use it at all <laughs> i've been using premiere for the past four years but i mean it was really cool to start out with that because it's so you know just complicated it's, it's a lot it's a lot of keyboard shortcuts which is awesome that's always really cool but um and so i've had moments where i mentioned that and they're like oh that's really cool like and then they kind of know like okay so you've had experience with this so based on that then when I mention this, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, I have had experiences where I have mentioned to a professor who wasn't even a film professor that, yeah, I I know Avid a little bit, not anymore. And they're like, oh, wow, okay, Mr. Avid over here. I'm like, I'm not trying to puff myself up, but, you know, um, it depends on the other person, too, how they respond. But, um, yeah, there's going to be moments where you just have to show people what you know. And like you said, you have to do it the right way in a way that doesn't come off as egotistical or um, in a way that is rude or condescending, but just a way to show like, hey, I just want to get this out here now. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. And um, once that happens, you're kind of speeding past the gauging stage where it's like, well, what do you know? What do what do you actually know? It's it's just getting it out there so you guys can move forward as as 
coworkers, if you will, mm. you know, as peers. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the important thing and something that people who are just entering in can figure out, or maybe we can help explain a little bit. It may take a job or two mm-hmm. with that individual to get them comfortable with you as a, as a, as a peer, um, or if not a, um, an experienced youngling to use some star Wars terminology, um, which I am a huge fan of Star Wars, by the way. <laughs> oh, big yeah. nerd, big nerd. Um, regardless, coming into the industry, there's all these stigmas and stereotypes mm-hmm. um, of the high school and the college video program, film program, mm-hmm. media program um, graduate of, hey, I'm the big shot. Mm-hmm. I know everything already. You can't teach me. And I think that's one of the biggest things that people use as a um, people step on rakes Mm -hmm. I should say Mm -hmm. Uh, when they come out of school and think they know everything you get into the real world you get into the industry and you're slapped across the face by the grip who's been doing it for 60 years just from one simple comment and then you're you're like you're you're super embarrassed and (laughs) to go run and hide not speaking from experience thankfully (laughs) but um, that's something that I think a lot of people experience that if they mm-hmm. were to just sort of change their mindset a little bit when they get out of those programs, mm-hmm. I think we're fairly good authorities on this. And something that we've both put into practice is coming at it from a servant mindset. Mm-hmm. If I am to be on a shoot with people I've never worked with before, totally open to taking PA or grip or mm-hmm. something that's a little lower right. on the food chain so that I can be introduced and, and, and maybe help in different areas um, that I might not be hired to do, but to show them that I am knowledgeable mm-hmm. and that I can take on more responsibility. Because unfortunately, as a young person in the industry, you have to accept that people will assume. Unfortunately, assumptions are very, very rampant in yep. our field. And it's just something you have to navigate. Mm-hmm. So how do you do that? If you are coming at a new opportunity as a film student or as someone who has... Um, who is on the younger side of things and you are uh, approaching it with an, Oh, I know everything. That's not going to get you very far. So what you have to do is um, go on to set, be humble and essentially take your time. Don't rush into any, uh, any situation thinking, Mm -hmm. you know, everything speak less, listen more. And in order to show, you know what you're talking about, wait for those opportunities for someone to ask for, whatever that thing is Mm -hmm. um, that you would be working with, have it ready, be prepared. Uh, That's some, those are some things that I have uh, implemented that have helped me a ton. Mm -hmm. Being prepared is huge. If you're a PA, here's a, here's my secret weapon. If, if there are any people out there (laughs) that are listening that want to know, and I'm sure I will share this many times in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, If I can have the leisure as a PA of knowing where we will be shooting a day or so before the shoot, what I'll do is uh, I'll go on Google Maps, find that location or both locations or however many there are, and make lists of places nearby Mm -hmm. using Google Maps that fall into different categories. Coffee shops, Mm -hmm. pharmacies, grocery stores, hardware stores, gas stations, places that I might need to be called to run to, Mm -hmm. and then make sure that people who are above me, quote unquote, know that I've made that list. Right. No one does that. Mm -hmm. Because no one does that, it's unique. If people start doing that because I just said it, it will no longer be unique, but I'm okay with that (laughs) because it helps. And it shows that you prepared and you care. That, always bringing stuff like um, bongo ties, Mm -hmm. towels is a huge thing. I always carry a towel with me now, extra pair of clothes, a knife, headlamp. Um, There's all kinds of small things you can put in your bag. So I highly encourage people to research just small things that will help you on set. Mm -hmm. Multi-tools. Sea wrenches. Yeah, um, I could go on, but um, <laughs> do you agree that like that? Do you have any other tips to share, maybe for people who are starting out that hmm. like this will get you noticed? Because I can go on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think to just echo what you said, uh, to just be prepared uh, for any people out there listening who were former Boy Scouts. I am one of those people. Same here. <clears throat> um, and. Uh, got my Eagle Scout in 2017. I didn't make it um, past star. I did not pass this. I one really test. didn't think I would. <laughs> I and I probably wouldn't have if I didn't have other people that were like, dude, you gotta, you gotta do this. But one of the big things, I mean, it's cliche. If you if you're a Boy Scout, 
be prepared. Mm -hmm. But that's so key in just anything. But like you said, having those things that are um, like just essential in, in emergencies or just like you just you just might need them. And you're going to realize every set that you're on, oh, shoot, we should have done this. I'll keep that in mind for the next shoot. Yes. And you're going to keep collecting. You're going to make a bigger list every set that you're on until eventually, I mean. You're going to need a bigger boat. You're, exactly. Bag. Yeah, just I would say be prepared. <laughs> know who you're working with, what you're working with. Um, no matter what role you're playing, I'd say just get to know the project as best as you can without overstepping, without like reaching out too much yeah. as a PA or as a gaffer and being like, hey, what about this? What about that? Because they might reach out and say, hey, that's really not your area. Don't bother. But I think just familiarize yourself with who's going to be there. Um, if they have like a call sheet with the people you're working with, check them out. See them on LinkedIn, Instagram, just to see who you're working with. So you're aware, um, know their names and uh, just be respectful. But I think that preparedness is like key because I can think of so many times in my life on a set um, where, oh, I was thinking about this the other day. One of the worst things, it's really not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things. Oh, but it is in your brain. But it, yes, <laughs> I was on set for a project I did with my school, which actually was a really good project in my opinion. I really liked it. It's on my website if you guys want to look at it. It's a, uh, they call them CC80 stories. It's like a mini documentary, but I was on set for the interview <laughs> and it was just in their home. It was a really casual interview and did not have batteries. The batteries I needed for these lights or for a Zoom, just double A's. And I was like, oh, no, I don't have extras. And, you know, it's not a quick thing to just go grab them out of the car if I don't have them in the car. Yeah. And so I had to ask the, the person I was interviewing, like, hey, can I use uh, some batteries? Nice. And, oh, my gosh, they're just batteries. Yeah. But, man, just like that not being prepared. And that person may not think, oh, wow, this person is not good. They clearly aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not going to make it in this industry. But it's still those little things that you just want to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Batteries, tape, tape. Um, pens. <laughs> the amount of gaff. Gaff tape, my goodness. Expensive. Invest in it. It yeah. is worth it. You are going to use it so many times uh, for little things, from sticking a lob to somebody to taping down a, a cable. You're going to need it. I would say, yeah, the preparedness is, is huge with that. Um, because if you have something ready for someone and they don't even know that they need it, that's going to show a lot. Um, one of the things that I thought of while you were talking, um, which was really cool, you had mentioned something about, you know, if someone needs something, uh, know what they're talking about and get that. Like it's yeah. a piece of equipment. There was something, I can't remember, on that set with Elvis, he had asked me to get something, some kind of grip equipment, and I brought it to him. And he was like, dude, I'm glad you know what that is. And I was yeah. like, yeah, I'm glad I know what that is too. And it was, it's just cool because, you know, that also shows like, okay, Lane knows what he's talking about in this area. Then I can assume that I can trust him with this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just be prepared, do your research, you know? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's, I sh I'm, I am debating back and forth in my head right now if I want to say this or not, because I do not recommend it only under very, 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 very specific circumstances. Like say the client is in a very fragile state. Mm -hmm. And if you are interviewing them in their home, mm. this is just to give someone out there an idea for if they cannot ask for batteries mm -hmm. and if there is no way to get them, if you are in a residential home, if it's a Zoom, you may need to find a couple of these, but check the TV remotes. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we ended up doing, actually. <laughs> find, the <laughs> find the things in the home that may have batteries discreetly mm -hmm. remove them and then put them back when you're done. Another Boy Scout thing, leave it cleaner than when you found it. <laughs> That's, I, I made it up to star. And like I said, it, I could not pass the swim test. It's I, long story short, that's supposed to be a joke, but it's not as funny when I said it out loud. Point being, no, the, swim test, the whole battery, hard. it's hard. The whole <laughs> battery thing though, it ties into creative problem solving. Mm -hmm. If you want to be on set and you do not have a lot of skill, if you can get good at solving small problems, yes you will get hired. Mm -hmm. If you can show that, hey, I can think on my feet and I can think fast, I don't know anything, but I can solve problems, that'll get you started. Yeah. And so um, in addition to that as well, if you are um, wanting to just jump in head first, that could be a good way to, um, to get yourself going with the whole... With the whole trust thing as well, um, I think that's also key. And I know we've talked about it a little bit and, and gone back and forth on this. Knowing your terminology mm -hmm. 
it's not something that you can easily find on a YouTube video or read in a book. There, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there that give you the basics, like stinger, brick, mm -hmm. sand, dirt, um, gobo, sea stand. There's a lot of weird terminology mm -hmm. you can only pick up when you're on set, but remembering what those are and what um, what names go to what pieces of equipment mm -hmm. will also get you very far. Yeah, I agree. And also, you're going to learn terminology in college that might not... It's outdated. It's outdated. Yeah. And yeah. so just be careful. Just listen while you're on set or while you're around people. Um, if you're in college right now or you've heard this before, um, when you hear the words non-diegetic sound and diegetic sound, people don't talk about... They don't say that. No. Like, they will not call it that in the real world but that's how you're going to learn it. There's going to be things like that. But like you said, you're on set, listen, be observant, and you're going to learn a lot just from being there. So let's go back to college for a second. Mm -hmm. How well do you think that has prepared you for the industry? And mm -hmm. I know as a college student myself currently, um, that can be a tricky question to answer because you don't know who's listening to this. Yeah. You don't know who will be checking this out <laughs> in the future. So if, if, uh, if CCAD calls you back in 10 years and wants you to speak on stage, they might come back to this and be <laughs> like, hey, what was Lane saying about us back in the day? And it'll be like, okay, um, this Just is one of those. us on a podcast. <laughs> right, right. This is one of those things where I personally have to be very careful about what I say as a yeah. host. I'll cover controversial topics if we go there, mm -hmm. and I'll give my honest opinion of them at the time. And I think that's key is remembering context. Mm -hmm. So that's one Absolutely. thing I want to point out now is that people change their minds. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of credit to people who give you a chance to explain yourself if you say something that you firmly believe in the time mm -hmm. and at, at, at the point of when you said it. And then in the future, new information comes up and right. then you have you change your opinion or your views. So it's a very touchy subject. Mm -hmm. However, I'll go first just to make it a little easier. Personally for myself, from my own experience, and please feel free to pair it if how I say it uh, is pretty accurate and you don't mm -hmm. want to expand on it too much because I understand. Um, I am currently taking classes with Full Sail Online. Mm -hmm. The reason I chose that program was so that I can be sitting here with you in Ohio in a podcast studio right. doing freelance work while getting an education. Mm -hmm. If I was on campus, if, if COVID wasn't a thing, so let's take right. COVID out of it. Yeah. If COVID was not here, I would potentially be in a classroom mm -hmm. eight to 12 hours out of the day, uh, every day, getting a four-year education. Mm -hmm. I have to ask myself, is that more valuable than working, on, working maybe half the time online mm -hmm as I would in college, and then spending all the rest of it in the real world and in the industry yeah. as a freelancer. Yeah. And so right now, the benefit that I have is I am getting a degree to keep in my back pocket, and mm -hmm. that's the only reason I'm taking this degree, is in case I want to start a family and I need that piece of paper so I can get a salary job yep. um, if I need to provide. Mm -hmm. My goal is to do freelance for the whole thing, but if yeah. I can't get there, backup plan. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, for me personally, and I think it's different for everybody, I did not need to take this degree. From what I'm learning now, there's been some great nuggets, really, really good pieces of information, few and far between though. They did a great job of cutting out a lot of the academic fluff mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff you didn't need to know. And so it's just, here's production, yeah. here's camera work, here's everything you need as a freelancer. And they, they didn't throw in a lot of extras, um, which I respect and I, and I like a lot. But the thing is, I would have been fine without it. However, it's a great benefit to me mm -hmm. because I can now bring this piece of paper to an employer Absolutely. and say, look, I know how to dedicate enough time to get a project done, which is, I think, a reason why people use that as a funnel. I think it's sad mm -hmm. that people use these pieces of paper as check marks to separate mm -hmm. you from the other applicants. But unfortunately, there's so many now that it it's almost has to be that way. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think we need to figure out a better way to hire, but we're getting away from the school point. Go. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a huge... I think now finishing college, I I realize like how I feel about that. And I think, I think throughout college, I had my opinion. I mean, you're going to be in a class where it's like, really, do I need to be sitting here le learning this? Mm -hmm. um, and that's any college, any major. Yep. I would say it depends on your where you're at in life. Some people... 
I mean, they, they're totally fine with just being in a classroom and doing work occasionally and then working another job and just going through the four years. That's totally fine. The college experience is fun. Just being able to hang out with people and be on campus and, and just be in a classroom. That's fun. I think especially now, like COVID hit when I was in my, what semester was that? My second semester of junior year. Um, and now I'm in my second semester of my senior year. And since then, that past year, I have been working so much more in like in the real world. I took a job with my church uh, and was filming with them to do these online services because that's what everyone's doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now I have this position where I'm uh, trusted with more responsibility and authority and I'm the creative director there. Uh, leading teams and like I'm like man I'm in the real world like I'm freelancing I'm I'm doing my own thing school is just like and this is nothing against the school it's just the way I where I'm at in life with work and with COVID everything's just so weird I know that's like a cliche thing to see, say now but mm-hmm. I'm in this place where I really enjoyed the college experience of being on campus and, and doing you know that and then I'm over here where I am so close to being done and, and I'm almost all, all the way in the real world, like already working, already connecting with people and doing my own work, doing freelance. And it's just this weird feeling of being torn. Um, and that's just me personally. I think it depends, like I said, where you're at in life. And so sometimes I look at college like, well, I'm already there. Like, can I just be done with this? Because I don't feel like I'm learning more being that I'm like at the end of my senior year. It's just these classes I need to get done. Um, and I think that I think I'm just at this point where if I was to just stop school right now, like I don't want to say drop out because I'm not trying to drop out, lose that money. Yeah, but neither, neither <laughs> am I. <laughs> but but if I, I'm, I feel pretty confident in saying that if I was to stop now or even last year when when I stopped, you know, with COVID, I think. I would feel pretty comfortable being in the real world. I think I've learned a lot over the past year, and so it has helped me tremendously to be where I'm at now. But, you know, I can say that I've learned a lot through college. I've learned a lot in the classroom. I've had professors that I will, like, I have learned so much from them. I have professors that I can call on who um, I've had for one semester, but I can call on them when I need help. I called a professor the other day who... Uh, is working mainly as a lawyer and a screenwriter Hmm. and I needed his help with contracts. And so I'm thankful that I have that connection that I would have never gotten had I not done some kind of college, some kind of higher education. And so I think there's so much value in it. I think it depends on the person, how you learn um, what you want to do with the industry, because there's so much you can do. Graduate high school. And if you have money or you want to get a job, um, buy some equipment or just start working towards that and just start learning from YouTube and just t- tour places and go talk to people and you can learn from that. And I think that's clear now. I think people see that and people are doing that. There's some people who have been uh, in the industry longer than me and both of us mm-hmm. that have never went to school. They never did. They never had to. Yep. Um, one of my favorite directors, Christopher Nolan, never went to school. I believe that's Correct. I saw an interview where he never went to school, like the traditional film school. Um, And you guys can double check. Uh, (laughs) I might be wrong. But there's a lot of people that that wasn't necessary for them. Um, I think for me personally, looking back at it now, I would not have as many connections as I do had I not gone to CCAD. And so I owe them so much for just that. And I'm very thankful for that because it's setting me up for a future where I've got all these connections I can lean on um, and and rely on when I'm in a pinch or when I need help or just a creative person to be friends with. So I think where I'm at now, the, the school has been very beneficial to me. I think it's, it's kind of the split, though, where I agree I could have just learned so much um, outside of the classroom on an actual set or on YouTube or master class. But I'm also on this other side, too, where I recognize how much the school has actually benefited me and helped me through connections. So me personally, this doesn't apply to everybody. I think I'm half and half. Yeah, that's totally fair. Mm -hmm. And I respect that quite a bit because our experiences are a little different because I'm an online student. Mm -hmm. And so because I chose that path, 
I was not able to benefit from those in-person connections. And I think that's key. One of the big things that film schools in particular still have going for them mm-hmm. is that you network with your professors and you network with your peers. Right. And those peers are the ones that you're going to work with in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to be careful as well according to what school you want to go to. If you can have an idea, and this is like a note to the high school students out there, if you have an idea of what area of film or production, assuming you're going to film school, uh, that you want to go into mm-hmm. before you apply to whatever institution, make sure that that institution matches that field yes. or that area because the peers that you meet and become friends with in that field will most likely, not saying this happens for everyone, but most likely will go into that area, and that is how you will then uh, gain more work in the future is because the friends that you make now, Mm -hmm. uh, assuming you're in college, will be the ones that get you jobs later. Mm -hmm. And so if you can pick the school that has that area of work, um, that's how you can make those networks, uh, those those networking skills and those soft skills uh, work for you. Mm -hmm. And then also another point on top of that as well, for those of us who do do online schooling, the burden of networking is upon us as online students to reach out and connect with our local communities. A lot of people would argue you can still network with your classmates. I've made a few friends. There's probably 15 to 30, somewhere in there, students per class that I take. Mm. With Full Sail, it's one class a month. So you're focusing one subject gotcha. for 30 days, mm. and that counts as a class credit. Oh, wow. um, I believe I'm saying that right. Full sale, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but the thing is, like, for for my current class right now, I'm in directing. And so oh, awesome. all of our studying is on the topic of directing. Mm-hmm. And our project for this month, oriented towards directing. Um, discussion boards, oriented towards directing. That's the idea. So replace directing with whatever topic, and that's how their system works. Mm. I don't know if that's equivalent to the credit, but essentially it's one class per month. And so the reason why I'm saying that is each month I get new peers. And with those new peers comes new potential connections. Here's the thing. With Full Sail and online, not just Full Sail, but almost any online institution nowadays, the people who are taking online classes are taking them because typically they don't have the time that a normal college student Mm -hmm. would to dedicate to their schooling. They're single moms, they're lawyer dads with three kids, they're... Um, really, really, really inspired and passionate entrepreneurs who are working their butts off um, 25-7. You know, it's Mm -hmm. um, the people who are in those classes are most likely not going to put a lot of effort in, and that includes communication. So it's hard to network with online students unless the person you are trying to reach out to is as passionate about connecting as you are. So I've given up on that basically at this point. Mm. Unless someone approaches me via a message, rarely will I reach out to a classmate of mine as an online student Mm. and say like, hey, let's get on a Zoom call together or let's um, try and do some sort of remote digital project because I really like you and your work. There's been a few people that I've reached out to and that we've maintained relationships, but out of so far the hundreds of students I've come across, Mm -hmm. like less than less than the fingers on my hands Mm -hmm. uh, that that came out wrong, but like less than 10 people probably do I stay in touch with. Yeah. And it's crazy with that in mind. If you are online, one of the best things that you can do is like you said in the past and in the past is uh, attend those networking events, Mm -hmm. go out, find people in your industry and network personally for myself. The whole reason why I took this degree and I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but there's a little bit of a twist here. The whole reason why I did this was so that I could have that freedom. I could have that schedule flexibility Mm -hmm. to go out and have coffee with the local DPs or meet the other PAs in the world so that if I can't make a set as a PA, I can ring up my other buddy who can then take my place so that I am helpful to that production that reaches out. Because sometimes you're in a bind. Sometimes I I literally just had an agency um, send me an email yesterday saying, hey, are you free on Wednesday to do a shoot? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm already committed to one, unfortunately. Um, I didn't give them someone else because I knew they already probably had someone in mind. But if you are presented with that situation, mm-hmm. you can then give the producer or whoever is running that set someone else's number. Yeah, totally. You can't give them that number if you don't know anybody. Mm-hmm. 
And so as an online student, one of the best things you can do is go out, find the local people in your area and make connections with them. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's a lot better than if you were to do that in the, in the film school world. However, not everyone is driven to do that. You don't have everyone being a, an extrovert. I'm actually an introvert. Um, however, I have, over the course of COVID and over the past few years, really, 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 really put in a lot of effort to um, make a effort to network and reach out to people because in this industry, your network is your net worth, unfortunately. Mm. I say unfortunately lightly because it's, it's one of those things where you are almost required to do that, and it's not a skill that everybody has. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason why I say unfortunately, because it takes time and effort, but anyone can develop it. I think all that being said, I think uh, to just reiterate what I was saying about my experience of the past four years, connections have been huge because it's not just like, oh, that's cool. I get to work with this person. Sometimes it's like good friendships. Um, like I'm thankful that like Jeremy, like that's someone who I met yeah. briefly one day and my friends were like, oh, you got to meet Jeremy. He's a video guy too. And we had a cool conversation briefly um, and then sparked like being able to work with each other and just like not only working with each other, but just having cool conversations. I run into him every once in a while at the, um, Olentangy River Brewing Company over off of uh, Polaris and yeah. 23. It's also the Roosevelt kind of. Um, and so I see him there. I see his wife there. And it's it's cool. Like it's uh, it's friendships that can come from these. Not everybody that you you work with is going to be like, you know, your best friend necessarily. But it's so cool to just um, reach out and meet people or people reach out to you. And I think what you were saying where you can, um, if someone offers you a gig and you can't take it, Instead of just being like, nope, sorry, being able to sit, tell them like, hey, look, I can't do this right now and I appreciate you reaching out, but I actually have someone who might be um, good for you to ask them and reach out to them. Even if they don't take that person, it shows that you care enough to um, give them a second option, but also you're giving that person that you're um, you're giving their contact, that's that's like really cool that you're like helping out a friend, you know, and I think, I think it's really cool, um, the friendships that have come out of these past four years. And so I'd say if you have the opportunity to connect with people, to network, then do it. Um, reach out to your classmates if you want to. And uh, when people reach out to you as well, try to maintain those relationships. Um, because as much as I love the film industry and as much as I love working in it, I think the, that I really do cherish the friendships and relationships a lot. And so that makes it all the better. Just makes it so much more fun, especially when you're on a set together with people you really care about. And because eventually you can get to a point where you're calling the shots, you're directing, and you want to get a crew full of people that you really care about and know, then by all means do it. But you have to build up that um, arsenal, if you will, that connection list. Um, and I think that's it's it's a long process. It's always growing. Takes time. Yeah, absolutely takes time. And I think with time being said, we're we're coming up on uh, our closing here, but. Mm -hmm. Just to reiterate, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head once again there with it takes time to build relationships. Mm -hmm. It takes time to be able to get to a point where you can have that crew and rely on people and build those that trust to circle back to what we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way you phrased it perfectly suits where I'm at right now, where I am looking for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. I have that list already, and I just am looking for someone to give me a shot. Yeah. And that's that's also why I wanted to make this show is so that people who are also feeling that same way, maybe they don't have that list, but they want a shot at doing audio or to be a camera operator or even direct. The people that don't have a platform and just need to get in front of others, that's why I wanted to host this show on top of a few other reasons, is to be able to give people that chance and that opportunity mm -hmm. and allow a space or create an environment where people can be discovered. So. With that in mind, for those of you who are listening on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, anyone who's listening on audio, please feel free to come check out the YouTube channel. And for those of you watching on video, thank you ever so much for taking the time to listen to this episode today. It's been a long one, but a really, really good time. Um, I really appreciate anyone who's made it this far. For anyone out there who does want to come on the show as a guest, 
please feel free to check out the YouTube description. That's where you can find this link to a Google form where you can essentially apply to become a guest on the show. I just need a little bit of basic information to know that you exist. And uh, essentially after you submit that form, basically list um, some contact info and what you want to talk about. I will then be able to um, get in contact with you and hopefully see you in the studio. And speaking of which, I do want to make sure I bring up our basically sponsor for the show, the Sycamore Studios. For those of you who may not be aware, the Sycamore is a production space hosted out of Plain City, roughly about 45 minutes out of downtown Columbus, northwest side. Uh, for anyone who's interested in trying out a studio environment, they have, I would say, a medium-sized space, about 3,000 square feet uh, of psych wall for new people to the scene, um, the small one-man bands, the people who are in our shoes, essentially, who want to try stepping into the world of studio production. That's the audience that they want to cater to here at Sycamore. They are looking to, uh, at this point in time, bring in productions that are kind of on a smaller scale to be able to work within their space. Not only do they have the psych available, um, which is that production studio wall, the one that kind of looks like a skateboard ramp, <laughs> Uh, I get asked all the time what those are. <laughs> Point being, um, they also have an editing suite in addition to this wonderful podcast space. So if you would also like to run a show or maybe you're thinking of starting a podcast, feel free to reach out and uh, see what they might have to offer. They would love to talk to you. So with that being said, Lane, I wanted to make sure I give you a special thank you. This is the longest conversation we've had, and I think it's been very productive. So yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time and hope to see you back someday even. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. I hope to be back soon. Absolutely. So um, before I forget, let's also get your handles. Mm -hmm. um, where can people find you on social media if they do want to reach out, if they like what you said and want to get in contact, or maybe even hire you to come on to direct or you know call the shots like you were saying? Uh, how can people best reach you once more? Yeah, once again, uh, you can find me on Instagram if you'd like at Yarrick Media, and you'll see that on the screen. And you'll see my personal accounts linked there as well, as well as my website. Feel free to reach out on Vimeo or to check my videos out there. Just Lane Yarrick in Vimeo. And uh, also connect with me on LinkedIn. Let me know that you exist, and uh, let's talk. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on, sir. Yeah, I appreciate you, the time. Man.